This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. With me, I have a friend and mentor, collaborator, colleague, and the editor in chief of Heart Rhythm Journal, Peng Sheng Chen, who used to be at Indiana, is now back in his home in Los Angeles. Welcome, Peng. Thank you. It's great to have you, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us on Heart Rhythm TV. There's been a bonus session with HRS 2020 Science, and you were talking about new concepts with ventricular fibrillation. Um, and it's also a, a partly a tribute to Ray Idaker. Tell the younger generation who Ray Idaker is and what his significance to the field of ventricular arrhythmias is. Dr. Idaker is a cardiac pathologist and uh, he, uh, his career focused on studying cardiac arrhythmia and the part of the career, uh, especially the ones that's uh, relevant to all of us now, is to use computerized method to detect uh, complex cardiac arrhythmias. So he was uh, one of the first to assemble multiple points of uh, activation and put them into a map and determine how the rhythm uh, is uh, in complex arrhythmias, such as ventricular fibrillation. Uh, that uh, achievement uh, gradually evolved into computerized mapping system in the operating room and then into the current uh, generation of uh, cardiac um, electrophysiology systems that's been used throughout the whole world for ablation. So uh, he is uh, an engineer and a software engineer by training. He used to work for IBM. But most interestingly, he was an excellent saxophone player. And the once I heard that the Bill Clinton, who is also from Arkansas, said that uh, Ray Edgar is the best saxophone player, but uh, after Ray Edgar has left, Bill Clinton is the best saxophone player. player. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know that obviously he's worked a lot with the mechanism of the arrhythmias, but then so much of the mapping, the intraoperative mapping, was so critical to developing defibrillation principles and defibrillation thresholds. He designed a defibrillation system, which was my re first research project, that uh, will transiently dissociate itself during the shock and therefore can immediately record post-shock activation without being saturated. So he proposed a mechanism where the, uh, all the defibrillation uh, was successful immediately by stopping all the wavefronts. Then afterwards, the same shock reinitiates VF. So uh, that uh, uh, development subsequently uh, was shown to be clinically useful because uh, the defibrillation threshold is very similar to the upper limit of vulnerability that uh, you, in order to have a successful defibrillation, you have to reach a threshold that does not induce uh, ventricular fibrillation during the sinus rhythm or pace rhythm. So uh, I think he has uh, made fundamental contributions to the understanding of the mechanisms of complex arrhythmias, especially VF and defibrillation. And uh, that has been widely used clinically uh, based on many of his uh, conceptual uh, discoveries. And what's so beautiful about our field, Peng, is that the field is still yet young. And, and so many of the giants are alive and well and it's really important for the younger generation to also study the history of electrophysiology. So thank you for sharing that with us. And that is the reason why we had this uh, session to honor him during the Heart Rhythm Society meeting. Unfortunately, we can't have it in person, but uh, we are having it uh, online. Now, shifting gears to what your original contributions have been for the past couple of years, I've been following it very closely, is the whole idea of sympathetic skin nerve recordings. And essentially what you've done so impressively is taken regular electrodes and filtered out so you can get above 500 Hertz and record the nerves in the skin, which is phenomenal. And I think for me as a VT specialist, we always focus on the substrate. We're ablating the scar, we're ablating the scar. But the real question about ventricular fibrillation and polymorphic VT is what is the trigger and why, as you say in your talk, does sudden death happen at Sunday at 7 p.m. rather than Monday, the next morning? And there must be some burst or there must be a match to light a fire. And there's flammable substrates, but there has to be a match that sets us off. So tell us a little bit about that journey 
of getting sympathetic nerve recordings and then where you're moving towards now with even recording before clinical VT occurs in patients? Yeah, the whole series of study actually started uh, on the dinner table with my wife. She actually now sits with me <laughs> in, the, in the same room. Uh, she is a pediatric neurologist and she has this idea of uh, uh, studying uh, nerve sprouting and her training is studying nerve sprouting in the brain. And she said, this must be applicable to the heart. So we did a serious study and we discovered that if you increase uh, the nerve sprouting and sympathetic hyperinnervation in the heart, you ended up with an animal model, a canine model of sudden cardiac death. Uh, the next I thought that was important was to try to record the nerve activity directly. So we recorded from the largest nerve structure that we know of, that's a stellar ganglion. And using that, we found in animal models, the uh, activation of the stellar ganglion triggers the VT and the VF in the canine model. So one day I was trying to do the study uh, in humans, record the GP activity using implanted uh, temporary pacing wire. Uh, in the post-operative pacing, pacing patients, and one of the fellow misplaced the electrodes. So the surface ECG leads uh, was actually what he thought was intracardiac lead, lead and vice versa. I looked at it, I said it has uh, the uh, nerve activity on it. Then we discovered the electrode was reversed. So now that's the first time I discovered that actually you can record the nerve activity on the skin. So on the skin, there are multiple different electrical signals. Uh, the very low frequency ones are ECG and the mild potential. The very high frequency ones are exclusive of the nerve activity because uh, ECG, the mild potential, doesn't have the frequency spectrum above 400 hertz. So if you filter high pass, that is alone, allow the nerve activity uh, to be seen because uh, their frequency is high, allow the frequency 500 hertz or above to pass. With high pass filtering, you can actually see uh, nerve activity on human skin. So this is uh, uh, one time, uh, first time that we can actually record sympathetic nerve activity with conventional ECG electrodes. And uh, with it, we, deter uh, we uh, published uh, about uh, its relationship with atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. So Peng, essentially you're the Eindhoven of uh, nerve recordings. I wouldn't dare to compare with Eidolfin. <laughs> we just uh, have a research tool that everybody can use. And do you think this is something people that are watching, they say, I want to start getting sympathetic skin nerve recordings. Is this something that's easily translatable and generalizable to anyone? It is easily translatable, uh, even with the existing re uh, research equipment. We have just published a manuscript on the, on the nature protocols on how to use uh, conventional available lab research equipment to do nerve recording in, hum uh, in animal models in humans. But I think uh, uh, with further technological development, it is possible to uh, build a very simple and a small device for nerve activity recording. I think what's really impactful is when people look at your papers and particularly the ones where you're monitoring SKN SKNA before VT episodes and you see that there's a burst of nerve activity and then that precedes the VT, then you have the VT and then you state that the VT itself, hemodynamically unstable, induces more sympathetic nerve discharge. So it's really important temporally that then you start getting into this vicious cycle of this cascade. And that really is a real beautiful pathogenesis of VT storm. And, and I know that you also have seen the diminution of that with stellate block. Yes, uh, there are in collaboration with Dr. Yong Mei Cha and uh, Dr. David Walega uh, of uh, uh, Northwestern, of Mayo Clinic and Northwestern, respectively, uh, injecting uh, local anesthetic to the static ganglion can suppress nerve activity. That's just the, one of the ways to uh, validate the techniques recording. And that might be a really great way to, for us to assess the adequacy of more permanent measures like stellate ganglionectomy, you know, sympathetic sympathectomies. I think so. I think it will be sure. clinically useful uh, to follow uh, neuromodulation procedures in general. Because for those that are involved with sympathectomies, we usually look at the chain, make sure histologically there's nerve tissue, 
and then hope that the patient's hands don't sweat. And that pretty much is the only metric that we have, but this seems like a great way to be able to tell. Peng, this is fantastic. Congratulations, and I look forward to collaborating with you. We've talked about different ideas, but it's great to be able to see this truly translational from bench to bedside, from nerve sprouting all the way to looking at patients just before the onset of arrhythmias. This is clearly a game changer, and I want to congratulate you and thank you for joining us on Heart Rhythm. Thank you for your interview. I'll just conclude with a quick quotation by Ray Eidecker because you invited him to give a 40th anniversary viewpoint. And he talked a little bit about his career, everything he's done, but he also mentioned that when he was five years old, he observed his grandfather die suddenly. And from that day on, he was terrified of sudden death and that was part of his mission. And as he goes on with this beautiful essay that he writes in Heart Rhythm, he talks about that it is even more troubling that this me in quotes, the consciousness, I cannot even imagine stopping at death, is a neural circuit that has evolved to give a survival advantage by being aware of the state of other neural circuits. So it's really appropriate to what you've been doing is using the brain to figure out the heart and then the nerve interaction and the autonomic nervous system. Thanks again, Pang, and congratulations. Thank you very much for the interview. And I want to emphasize it has been really a, uh, a privilege and a pleasure to have uh, been Dr. Eidecker's student over uh, in the beginning of my career. We Thank all you. owe him a great deal of gratitude. Right. Thank you. Thank you.